Uh, hey guys, uh, so I'm coming at this from uh, with two hats. So as a former operator, I was an RAF uh, fighter pilot, uh, Brit Weapons School graduate, and then uh, lucky enough to be the first guy to fly Raptors for the US Air Force back in 2006, 2009. And I didn't know it then, but that was the genesis of, of Red Six Aerospace. And I became the founder and, and CEO of Red Six in 2018. Um, I, the reason I, I founded Red Six was because I was really passionate about a problem that we were struggling with, and you will all be intimately familiar with, even back in 2006, and that is training. How do we fundamentally train? And we were struggling to, uh, to put assets up into the air. We understand there are huge opportunity costs to putting uh, guys and girls up to provide red air. Uh, it's really expensive. And, and critically, how do we train against near-peer adversaries? And that was something that was, we were just failing. It's only gotten worse since then. It would be fair to say that we're in a crisis right now. There's with 2,000 pilots short on the front line. And that is becoming an increasingly uh, difficult problem to solve. So I formed Red Six in 2018 when we figured out um, fundamentally a, a unique solution to augmented reality. Augmented reality right now is a fundamentally an in, indoor solution only. The best in class. As soon as you step outdoors, it doesn't work. As soon as you go into dynamic environments and move around, it doesn't work. What we've done at Red Six is figure out how to make augmented reality work outdoors and in dynamic environments. And my vision is we put synthetic aeroplanes into the sky and which we can train against. My vision for the future is that we no longer put a physical red air asset in the air. We don't need to. Using synthetic uh, training, live virtual constructive, and a, a combination of the tech that we've developed, um, I don't think we should be putting physical assets into the air anymore. Give everyone an understanding of what, what the product is that you're working on, where, where you're showing actually red, red aircraft through the existing visor of, of the pilot's helmet. Sure. So I think it's worth framing the, the overall landscape of AR and, and VR. My, my, my personal take is that VR will ultimately be a subset of uh, AR. The future is an AR future. Of that, I have no doubt. But the problem is, uh, right now, AR, is, uh, as I said in the opening, is an indoor solution only. And uh, as soon as you step out, outside, it doesn't work. So it, it has limited use cases. My personal take is that AR is an interesting technology. It's kind of a solution in search of a problem. But for a ubiquitous AR solution to, to be out there and, and mainstream, it has to be mobile in nature and it has to be able to work outdoors. If you can do that, now you have real use cases for AR. So what we did at Red Six Aerospace, we started off actually with uh, two race cars. And we put two guys in VR in race cars on separate tracks, one in the UK, one in the US. Both guys in real race cars on real race tracks went into a VR world, they met each other and they raced. We've taken that technology and evolved it into AR now. So what we've developed is, and actually in conjunction with, with AppWorks, which is how we got our start, our start is um, a complement to the live virtual and constructive ecosystem. Live virtual constructive or synthetic training is undoubtedly the, the way of the future. It has to be. Um, however, live virtual constructive is only a 50% solution. Why is that? Because it's a beyond visual range solution only. So as soon as you get inside of 10 nautical miles and you start to go from that, looking at the radar scope to heads out, where is that guy? I'm gonna put my gun shield in and go for a fight. The whole training system collapses. Why is that? Because we can't visually display them. Why is that? Because augmented reality doesn't work outdoors. It doesn't work in dynamic environments. Well, it does now. So at Red Six, we've created a patented uh, visor technology, which we're developing. Um, certainly over the next 18 months, we'll have a 120 degree field of, of view outside uh, daylight capable low latency display, and my vision is that we can look through that display which incorporates into a helmet, look out, and see virtual airplanes which we can go and fly and fight against. And the beauty of that is if we have the intel on the platforms and we can code, that we can go train against anything we need to, be it J20, PAC-FA, and all of a sudden now the training gets relevant. Second, second to that is, you know, we're, we are critically short on pilots in the front line, so we have to be smart about how we keep our pilots and how we train our pilots and the stuff that you, you were doing with, with VR and PTN is, is a great start, but I think we have to go further than that. So every time we're putting a pilot up to, to train and be red air, he's not doing what he should be doing, which is blue air. And that's exactly the value of the product we've developed at Red Six. We can go up, we can use all of our pilots, all of our assets to fly blue air, therefore mitigating, bringing costs down and not having to provide red air. And you just said, I mean, bringing costs down. I mean, I, th I think that's that's an obvious um, sort of result of of training in the way that you're talking about. What what is what is the actual? I mean, you're a pilot yourself. I mean, what what is the human impact on training in this way versus training with with physical aircraft? 
I think there's twofold. I mean, there's a bunch of pilots in the audience, and, and, and even, you know, you, you guys know the, the days that you work, you know the fatigue, you know the loads on the strains on the family. Um, so, so the first thing is the, the physical demands on, on time and effort for the pilots are reduced drastically. Secondly, we're spending billions of dollars a year providing red air assets. We should not be doing that. We need to be smarter with tech to, to mitigate those problems. And the obvious question I get asked is, well, why don't, you just, why don't we just do this in simulators? Well, we know anyone that's you know, stepped into a fighter air, airplane, be it an F-22 or something else, and you're pulling nine Gs, the fundamental difference or the cognitive load on the operator is absolutely different to being in simulators. So if we accept that we have to train in real life and we have to go up and fly airplanes, then how do we do it smartly? We need to be preserving our assets. We need to be um, uh, using them for blue air sorties only. And we need to be using technology, AR, LVC, provide red air assets. And if we can do that, we fundamentally change how we train. It's perfect. How, Lieutenant Colonel, how does, how does this capability to actually learn faster, learn information faster, how does this change then the, the operational environment? So, you know, it's, it's twofold, right? With complex systems, you change one aspect of the system and then you see the effects downrange. Kind of what Daniel was talking about, the, the pilot shortage. You know, when we talk about the levels of learning and how we learn as human beings, we're very focused in air education and training command on harnessing that because if you can maximize your resources, you maximize the human performance, you can do things uh, potentially faster. You can get a different product, a product, when we call a product, a pilot that is ready for the multi-domain operations that they're going to face as whatever weapon system they go to. And so... We have to also, this, we can't just throw technology at it, right? We have to make sure that we have the science, the data scientists looking behind this, and also the ability to iterate so that we can find out when you talk about the, the peak performance. You know, humans uh, perform better under a certain amount of stress, but then there's a rapid fall off when you go over, and Daniel and I were kind of laughing as talking about the helmet fire. I mean, that, that's when someone just locks up and it's sensor overload. And so if you can go right to that, to that uh, you know, that's where instructor pilots over years of, of seeing students can push, but it's a very kind of subjective thing. If we can get to that objective uh, ability to push that and then put it in a virtual reality where you can do iteration over iteration, we're going to get way faster. Right, right. And, and Dan, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to how efficient are we with the resources that we have, right? We're always operating under capital rationing. We don't have, we have finite resources. So the, the stuff that the guys are doing at, at PTN is some remarkable results in terms of getting guys and girls through onto the front line. Well, if you can take AR and the, the likes of what we're doing at Red 6 with the, the you know, um, augmented reality dynamic environments, putting virtual airplanes into the real world that pilots can see against, well, how efficient can you be within each individual sortie? How many repetitions can you get rather than you know, against a real asset? And so they, it leverages the technology to really increase efficiency with not just with, you know, um, within a, a training syllabus, but within each individual um, training sortie as well. Um, and, and it builds exactly on what you guys are doing at uh, PTN.